Okay, let me explain something about the, the last class, those who are watching by video. There was a problem with the audio setting, and I didn't realize that until later when I was viewing it after I uploaded it to YouTube. I was testing it later, a few days later, and noticed that it's almost impossible to hear. You have to turn your volume up all the way on your device, on your phone or your tablet or your computer. And so I'm going to try to fix that if I can. Uh, try, we're gonna, what we're going to do this morning is I'm just going to redo that whole class right now. Okay, Mike? I'm just going to. Did was it okay? <laughs> really? All right. Well, why was that funny? <laughs> I, no, you're being serious, right? So, all right. Never mind. We're going to start the recording over. All right, ready? Let me clap again. <laughs> Yeah, well, at the beginning, it, it's, it's uh, Sharon gets me the water, and I left all that part on there, that one. Uh, the very last class, number 12. This is 13. Okay, so maybe it was uh, tolerable for Mike, and maybe for some, maybe on your device it came out okay. I was trying to listen to it in the car on the way back from Austin with it hooked into my sp car speakers it, with the volume on my phone all the way up and the volume in the car all the way up and the road noise was so loud maybe it's my car uh, I couldn't hear it so I don't know how it was for you so I'll, I'll see what we can do about that but I've adjusted this one and it's very easy to accidentally bump the setting the switch on this that adjusts the volume so I think we got it right all right well, yes, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is the, the road noise in the Lexus would, would solve these problems that your minister is having. And if, you know, people wanted to get together and uh, do something about that, I think the Lord would bless that in a great way. All right, so in John 1, a couple final textual criticism comments so we can look at this new area of some principles for interpreting the Gospels. But I mentioned this a couple times already in a sermon on Sunday night. I mentioned it and then decided we didn't have time to address it, and I left it alone. And at the end of class, uh, I only brought it up, but I didn't get to say what I wanted to say. But here in John 1.18, no one, is, no one has ever seen God, the only God. The only God, the ESV says. Now, the ASV, the King James versions, the King James... King James and the New King James versions and others say Son, the only begotten Son. And notice the ESV translates monogenes, only begotten in most translations, older translations, as just the only. And we can address that, you know, when we study the Gospel of John, we can look at that. Some think, well, they're trying to take out the deity of Christ because th that was actually an, actually an argument some of our brethren were making is that when in John 3.16 where the text says God gave his only begotten son, that monogenes, only begotten in, in our older translations, that's used five times and only by John in the Gospel of John and in 1 John. It, it's found nowhere else. But some of our brethren were actually arguing that newer translations that took that changed that to just the, the one and only son, some Bibles will say, or the only unique son, one of our own, Hugo McCord, a Greek scholar who trans made his own translation in, of the New Testament, was ex excoriated and roundly condemned by many of our brethren because he translated it only unique son and not only begotten son. And so there was all this concern about that as though that's trying to take out the deity of Christ. But look at this verse. The ESV doesn't say only begotten, but it says the only God. Obviously, they're not trying to diminish at all the deity of Christ in, in the way that they, they translated it. I know it's not familiar to us because the golden text of the Bible, the most familiar passage in the Bible to people today besides judge not that you be not judged, uh, Matthew 7, 1, is, uh, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So we're very familiar with that older reading of that verse. But the point is, the ESV has the only God, and some manuscript evidence suggests it's son. But what's interesting is that in the 1950s, 
We've talked about the papyri and how early these are. Uh, papyri or papyrus 66. Now this is discovered, this was published in 1956. So it's a relatively recent discovery and that document, it goes all the way back earlier than the uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and other Greek manuscript evidence we had previously, that points to the only, the one and only God, that, it, that it's a, a, a flat, explicit affirmation of Jesus' deity. This is Papyrus 75. Again, this was uh, discovered in the 1950s. And this also shows us the only God. It has Theos for God instead of Weos, Son. And that also, that, now that's the external evidence. We think this is, old, this is a, a fragment from the Gospel of John, the oldest piece of manuscript evidence we have that, that takes us closest to the original document that John wrote. So it's very exciting to think of these papyri and, and how they're confirming what we have in our Bibles and helping us better translate our Bibles even now. So the, that's the external e evidence and that fits the internal evidence because John 1.1 1, 1 says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then at the end of at verse 18 is the close of the prologue and he says again he is the only God. That would be an beginning and end when you bracket something that's an inclusio we've talked about that over and over it's a literary device that puts an emphasis on a unit marks off a particular unit so that's another one of great interest we won't discuss in detail right now but what I said is when we look at the gospel of Mark the, the probably the most controversial and the most significant manuscript problem we have is the what's what's called the long ending of Mark. Does it belong in our Bibles or doesn't it? There are Greek manuscripts that end at where, where, with what we have in our Bibles as verse eight. And others' manuscripts have a longer ending and some have an, an additional ending that's shorter. And the shorter and longer endings vary in their content and so textual critics have to weigh and decide and make decisions about, well, what, what's the correct reading for our Bibles? And I want you to notice here in the ESV, this, the reason I have this up here on the screen is just notice here, you'll have this note. Uh, some of the, early, of the earliest manuscripts do not contain 16, 9, through 20. So they're just telling you that, but then they are putting it there for you to read, but it's in brackets, right? The double brackets, just like the pericope adulteri, like the woman taken in adultery in John 8. There's some question about whether that belongs in John, um, whether it belongs in Luke, whether it belongs in the gospel accounts. And then you'll see uh, over here, the New American Standard Version, for example, also puts a line there and then has the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. Now, w when the ESV says some, some of the earliest manuscripts and the New American Standard Version also says something along those lines, really it's the, the two earliest major Uncials. Remember we said the majuscules, the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. You can go to the British Museum in London. You can see Sinaiticus there. And you can see that they're, they're, the, the long ending of Mark isn't there. We'll talk about the evidence for it, the arguments for the long ending and against it, and let you be a textual critic there. But just be aware, that's why a lot of your Bibles will have it footnoted. You might look in your Bible and see, is it a footnote? Uh, is it bracketed? Is it set apart in italics or some or something like that? But that's, again, because of the question about the manuscript evidence. So this is what we would do. We would look at the external evidence, uh, which I just briefly mentioned a moment ago, and then we'd look at the internal evidence. Is it consistent with the rest of the book of Mark? Well, in the Greek text, it's, it's according to Greek scholars, 
strikingly different, it's noticeably different in the vocabulary and syntax and language that it do, if you were reading it in Greek, it, was like, it would be like to you, like all of a sudden you're reading something written by someone else, not by the author of the rest of the gospel. So that's, the, that's where you weigh the internal evidence. But as, again, as I said, we don't have to be alarmed uh, by that sort of thing. So that's, uh, that's all on textual criticism. Unless you have a question or comment on that, I'm going to leave that and get to this final area before we can give an overview of each of the Gospels and uh, lead up to our study of Mark. Anything um, on that? Here we go. I hope this area will be practical and helpful, and I may rush through some of it so we can, we can get done by the end of class and then be able to have an even break where the next class, so far I haven't been able to do that. Most of the classes, I have a few minutes I have to tack on to the next class before I get into the next area, but we'll see. But that means I'll probably be spending more time on these first few. There's eight principles I'm going to give you here, and we'll probably give some, some detail on the first few, and then maybe just mention some of the others, and I'll put scriptures up there that will be on the video, and if you, did anyone get the file that I uploaded to the website? If you, if you got it, uh, it before I corrected it, there's a, there's a big mistake uh, near the very end that I corrected, and then, so I, so I deleted that one and re-uploaded it, so you might want to do that, go back and, and download the new one that uh, is corrected. All right. Well, let's think, about, let's think about now, as we go to the Gospels, we want to be careful, like we are with all of Scripture, in how we interpret this, this uh, section of Scripture. Be, and, and the problem we might have to understand here, we might need to be aware of, is that we can often misinterpret the Gospels, like any other book of the New Testament or the Bible, if we read them as uh, written directly to us, okay? Now, of course, all the Bible is written to us. Ultimately, all of God's Word was intended for all of God's people for all time. However, however, of course, originally, uh, they were written to specific individuals or audiences, and we need to keep that in mind in order to properly understand them. There's an important hermeneutical principle here that that we need to keep in view. And I know you understand it, but let's remind ourselves of this, that the interpreter must seek to understand the meaning that's intended by the original author. This is a big controversy in our own nation with the Constitution and with judicial activism. And judges thinking, well, I, the, constitu the Constitution can mean whatever I uh, say it, whatever we judges say that it means. And so if they want to read some new right into the Constitution that wasn't there, originalists, I would hope that we would be originalists, constitutionalists, we would object by saying, well, wait, what did the original authors intend when they said that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion? Did they mean that there could be no prayer in public schools? See, that's how it was interpreted later. Sep complete wall of separation between church and state. But that's not what the original, that's not what the, the framers intended. That's not what the original intent was. See how we can misunderstand something, and it can have great consequences, the mis misinterpretation or misapplication of it if we don't understand the original intent. So we, we, we need to look at the meaning to the original author, uh, or rather that the original author had, to the original reader. So that's why we talk about the provenance of a document, meaning the, the setting, the time and place in which it was written and the people for whom it was written and all of that. When we introduce a book, we spend a little time on that sort of thing because in order for us to understand the meaning that it has for us today, for God, for God to speak to us through His Word now, we have to first understand what it meant to them then, right? And as we've said before, it, the text can never mean now what it never meant then. It, so the problem is a lot of times people just want to open the Gospels or open the New Testament, and, and it's almost like if you got a piece of mail that the postal worker 
dropped in your, we can't say uh, mailman because that's sexist, right? So it's postal worker, delivery person. Uh, so <laughs> he drop, dropped it in your box, but it's really your neighbor's. And you just open it up and read it like it was written to you. And it might have something in there that you find interesting and helpful, but uh, it's, it was originally written for someone else. And we need to realize we're, we're sort of reading someone else's mail. So that, so that the meaning God wants for us today needs to be understood through that, right? You, we all get that. We get that. Now, we've already talked about the difference between reading the Gospels vertically, where you read through each one and study each one as its own literary unit, the way God gave them to us, right? And horizontal, uh, co the comparison of the different parallel accounts and comparison of the, the whole records of each gospel, that can be very helpful to show the particular emphasis of each writer. We've contrasted that with just sort of pulling out random pericopes and looking at them in isolation and just looking for a little moral lesson or, or only reading them as harmonizations where you just sort of uh, try to um, put them together into a harmony of the Gospels and just study the life of Christ. Well, since we've already covered that, I just want you to know these principles, th these deal with when we're studying an, a, an individual account. Now, it would apply, of course, to horizontal you know, to comparison reading also. Please, please hold on my calls uh, until after class. <laughs> All right, so here's, <laughs> here's some guy, I'm sorry, Jessica, I do that to everybody when they're, sometimes Don's uh, train will, his uh, ringtone of the choo-choo uh, chugging through will, will go off and we, we have a little fun. All right, some, here are some of these guidelines then. As I said, there's eight, we'll see how many we can get to. The, the, I have a lot more on the early ones and a little bit less on the later ones. So let me give you some of these guidelines for interpreting the gospel. These are uh, from largely from Kirstenberger, uh, Kellum, and Quarles uh, in this great, great work called The Cradle, The Cross, and The Crown. And this is an introduction to the New Testament that it's, it's written for the the lay person or the common reader but it also has a good scholarly emphasis to it a lot of good stuff in it I can recommend to you so all right number one seek to understand how individual pericopes individual accounts or episodes in the Gospels how they relate to the purposes of the gospel as a whole so in other words not just reading an individual account or an episode, Jesus has an encounter, or uh, Jesus teaches, and then go to the next one, and then just look at each one as sort of its own isolated unit. But how is this contributing to the purpose that, say, Mark or Luke has for the whole gospel? So let me explain. When you look at Mark, in Mark's introduction, look at Mark 1 in verse 1 here. This really sets up the theme of the whole gospel right at the beginning this introductory statement in the begin here notice the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ we'll look at this text in detail in mark when we get to mark the son the son of god the son of god he said i'm telling you i'm giving you this story I'm giving you an account about this Jesus Christ, but that he's the son of God. So they're show, he's showing Jesus' identity as he's Jesus, the Christ, he's the Messiah, he's the son of God. So we want to read the, the individual pericopes in the account, or rather in the whole gospel. See, well, what is this saying about Jesus' identity as the son of God? For example, in Matthew, Matthew's introduction points to Jesus' identity. Here we look at the beginning and notice the, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So notice the Jewishness of this. It's a, the, this is the Jewish gospel. So there's this concern for showing Jesus' lineage right from the start as the, the Messiah who is coming, the son of David. So he, he emphasizes Jesus' identity as, as the, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then as the introduction continues, he says he's Emmanuel, the one Isaiah would be Emmanuel, God with us, or the son of God. So we need to read his gospel in, in that light. 
And, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we look at Matthew and give an overview of Matthew. Now, in Luke, I've got a little bit more here. Let me just mention, in, here in, in chapter 1, 31 through 33, you see this affirmation of Jesus' identity through the announcement of Gabriel the angel. He's the son of the Most High. He's going to sit on the throne of his father and reign over the kingdom of his father, David, and he'll reign forever. He will sit, he shall become called son of the Most High, and he will sit on the throne of, of his father David, and he will reign over his kingdom forever. So there's this idea of the eternal uh, reign of Christ on David's throne. But also in the conclusion of Luke's gospel, so here at the beginning of, in the end, we see a, a really powerful emphasis of Jesus as the one to whom all of Scripture is pointing. He's the object of all Scripture. He's the resurrected, reigning Messiah. He offers forgiveness and repentance and the Holy Spirit to those who come to Him on His terms. They worship Him. He's the one who's worthy of our worship. And this will be especially important as you go through Luke's Gospel, that really Jesus tells us here at the end that all the Bible is about Him and that we need to read the Bible Christologically that, that with uh, looking for Christ. So. Again, now we'll go through Luke and we see, ah, you can see how he's bringing this out as he goes through the different episodes that he records for us in Jesus' life. Now in John, we had a three-part series on the prologue. I did three sermons. I'd like to somehow try to include them in the, in the series on, that I'm posting to YouTube. But we looked at the prologue and this very powerfully, very dramatically announces Jesus as the divine Son. Now that's, that's if verse 18 should be the only begotten Son or the one and only Son, or if it, if it should be the one and only God, then Son isn't mentioned in the prologue. It's, it's implied though and comes up very early in John. But He's the one, He's the Son, He's the one who came down from heaven to reveal the Father and to manifest His glory. So again, we need to read the Gospel of John in light of that, that he's trying to show us how in, in this miracle and in this encounter and in this uh, sermon that he gave, he's manifesting the glory of God and he's revealing the Father to us. So think, think of the Gospels in this way, that they were written to reveal the identity of Christ and, and they're written to bring people to, to faith in him. So that's how we need to read them, not just as, well, let me read this and take a little moral story from it, like Jesus with the woman at the well, and so we learn that uh, we need to talk to people about the Lord like Jesus did with the woman, and, and we need to have good and honest hearts like the woman, and, she, and we need to tell other people, like she ran back and told everyone in the village, I found uh, uh, the prophet, who, the Messiah, who told me all things I ever did. Well, there are some, some good lessons like that from Jesus' encounters with individuals. But, but see, that is part of a theme that John is developing and a picture that John is painting. Now, at the beginning, you can't see on the video, but I've been showing lately some, some Bob Ross. Let's get, our, let's get Bob in here. Let's get Bob in the video here. I've been showing some Bob Ross. Um, to, so, that the, so that the projector won't go to sleep. And if you watch Bob and he's putting these, uh, these background colors on and he's dabbing things here and there, at first it, they, they, they just seem like random things being slapped up there on the, he's doing all this in 22 minutes, uh, a whole painting. And so it doesn't look like it's going to be anything. But then you see as he continues, oh, that's the background. Those are the trees there in the distance, those little blobs he put up there. Now he's putting things in the foreground, and now I understand. Then you see he's developing, he's, he's piece by piece putting together a portrait. And that's what the gospel writers are doing. So that's what we mean when we say let's, let's read the gospels uh, Christocentrically or Christologically. That is, and, and this is what we mean, in each account, I don't know if you can see that there at the bottom. 
this is what we need to ask as you read through. What does this text right here, what does it tell me about Jesus? Not just, well, okay, here's the parable of the sower, or here's, uh, here's Jesus rebuking Simon. Uh, and so I learned something about Peter here, and I learned something about uh, interacting with others, or I learned this moral principle, whatever. But remember, the, the emphasis, the, the key here is Jesus. What does this text tell me about the identity of Christ that John is developing, that Mark is developing, that Luke is developing, or Matthew? Now, secondarily, now also, or we could just say additionally, let's say it that way. The Gospels are written as a guide for our beliefs and behavior. We go to the Gospels, we appeal to Jesus' example and his teaching as a model for us of discipleship, okay? So for Jesus' followers, the, the imitatio Christi, right? Uh, Rose is always throwing, is Rose here? Rose, I can't see you, would you stand up? Oh, you are, you are standing, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've done that so over and over. It's, it's, still, it's still mildly amusing. But uh, Rose likes to throw around these Latin sayings whenever you're talking to her. It's always, you know, the imago dei, or, you know, or all this stuff. And the, um, the um, amatio Christi, the imitatio Christi, the imitatio, imitation, the imitation of Christ. It just makes you sound smartical if you throw out a Latin term and give it an official theological uh, label like that, but that's that is what we're talking about imitating imitating Christ. That's what the the Gospels are about now now But see it's not quite that simple. It's more complicated because Jesus was unique. He was sui generis. Ah, oh, there see another one just comes to the surface We can't suppress the Latin it just comes out, but uh, he's in a class by himself so not everything he does can be applicable to us. For example, when Jesus went into uh, John 2, and, and uh, when and you read in Matthew and Luke, when he turned over the, the tables of the money changers in the temple, can I say, well, look at Jesus' example here. I'm going to go down the street here into this community church. I'm going to go into Joe Alstein's church where he's perverting the gospel and leading people astray, and I'm going to knock over the pulpit and, and throw the microphone down, and uh, I'm going to... Well, Jesus did that, Jessica. Okay, I'll go to jail. I'll go to jail. Well, hey, uh, if that's uh, you're going to be persecuted, right, for for the gospel's sake, it, maybe I need to, to to maybe I need to go into some church building and start throwing tables around. Well, of course, I can't do everything that Jesus did with the authority that on which he acted. He said, "This is my Father's house." No one else could say that about the temple. No one could go in the temple and say. You know, if, if you came home and there was a bunch of kids from the neighborhood, let's say you're a teenager, a bunch of kids from the neighborhood, just broke into the house and were eating food and watching TV and playing video games, you could, you could go in there and say, hey, this is my father's house, get out. And you could, you could knock over maybe the table and maybe throw something around and say, get out of here and shove them out the door. Right? Because it's your father's house. That house belongs to you. Jesus could do things. See, sometimes we want to look at Jesus like in Matthew 23. He, he rebuked the religious leaders. And he was vehement in his condemnation. He excoriated them. And I know I used to use that for being really sharp and, and, and rude with people that I disagreed with. And I thought, well, you know, Jesus, hey, Jesus rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees. He called them hypocrites. Now, it's true maybe we can appeal to that let me say you know when we're preaching and people think your preaching always needs to be uh, milk toast and never never sharp and pointed and you can't ever offend anyone and we might say hey Jesus called people hypocrites Jesus offended people he was bold he was direct I, I do think there is some example there but see how we have to be careful in how we're applying that Jesus was unique he did know people's hearts and so he could condemn people in a way that you and I can't when, when we don't see any fruit of their actions and, and we can't look into their hearts necessarily and judge their motives and know what they were thinking like Jesus could. What about sometimes people will say, well, you know, uh, uh, Jesus kept the Sabbath. Sabbatarians will say, Jesus is our example and we're to be disciples, we're to follow him. Well, Jesus kept the Sabbath. So, so we, we should keep the Sabbath. Saturday should be holy to us. Well, 
right? He lived under the old covenant and he brought a new covenant and under the new covenant where the Sabbath is not bound on us. And so that's, that's why we have to ask, okay, well, what actions or characteristics of Jesus were, were unique to him and which were normative? Which one can we say, well, now this is something we all need to strive to imitate, okay? That's what we're going to do as we go through the Gospels. Now, you've probably done that just intuitively, but we want to be more conscious of it as we, as we study through the Gospels. All right, look at this. Examine themes. Examine themes in the headings and introductions. Look at the headings and introductions and program, programmatic statements, okay? Big words again. Well, what does that mean? Look, look at some headings. Like, again, in Mark's gospel, when he says, uh, this is the beginning of the gospel. I'm telling you about the gospel. This is what the good news is. It's about Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. But see, Son of God then becomes very important in Mark. There at the beginning, and then in the middle, Peter makes the great confession. You're, you're the Christ. He identifies him in similar terms to the way Mark begins his gospel. And then again, at the end of his gospel, in chapter 15, 39, the centurion dramatically looks up. He looks up at the cross and says, truly, this was the Son of God. So, and there are other references I'm leaving out here. So, you have kind of a heading here where you're getting a clue as to what we should be looking for as we go through the gospel. In Matthew's account, we already said he's the son of Abraham. We look at his Davidic uh, lineage right there at the genealogy at the start. But the suggestion is made that he's the founder of a, of a new uh, spiritual Israel, that he's bringing, he's bringing, he's really fulfilling the purpose for which Israel existed. He's really being the true Israel of God and bringing a new Israel. And, in, and you see that in the very first verse where you have the word genealogy. This is where you see how I have here at the bottom the importance of checking translations, comparing translations, using good commentaries that, that may point out to you that the word genealogy, whoops, the word genealogy um, is actually the idea of a genesis or a beginning. It can be understood that way. And so, that's, and, that, and that's how the Old Testament begins, in the beginning. Matthew apparently sees himself as uh, writing scripture, like the book of Genesis, and telling us about the founding of a new Israel. There's a, there's a clue to this, for example, in chapter 19, verse 28. It's a verse we don't talk a lot about, but notice where Jesus said to uh, Peter and the disciples, look at this right here. Uh, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. But look, look at that. How often have you ever heard that text addressed? Truly I say to you, in the regeneration is the Greek word. There's going to be a renewal coming and a new state. There's going to be a new world coming. And I'm going to reign over that and you, my disciples, will be a part of my rule. And you have this hint there at the beginning that Jesus is bringing this, he's now instituting that. So we have the already aspect of it, but there's still the future consummation, the not yet, already, not yet. We, we, we've talked about that in, in other lessons. All right, so the headings. Now, what about introductions? introductions in Mark's introduction not just verse 1 but all the way through verse 13 when Jesus cast the demon out you have this emphasis right from the beginning of Jesus authority over demonic forces and that he has authority as the son of God and that uh, something we'll, we'll, we'll mention here in a moment too that comes up in, in, in how Mark uses repetition we want to look at the, the rest of the Gospels in light of that. John's prologue, as we already said, introduces all the major themes. It's like an overture. Think of the 1812 overture or overture, you know, uh, Mozart's overture to the magic flute. Some of these familiar orchestral pieces are uh, pieces of classical music. Well, what, the, what does the overture do? It's, it's written last and it gives you, or 
it, it can be written last because it gives you all of the songs coming up. In fact, in the old versions of like um, Cinderella, the animated Disney animated Cinderella, some older movies, you have to sit through this lo these long credits while they play an overture. It has little clips of all the songs that are coming up in it, right? And uh, I think some of the old musicals are that way. It's like, wow, the credits are forever. They just keep showing credits. I'm just a blank screen with credits. Nothing, nothing happening as the whole overture plays. That's an overture. John's conducting this great piece, and he's introducing Christ as, as, this, as God in the flesh, who manifests the glory of God, who comes to bring new life, who comes to bring light and life, all those things that become emphasis in John's gospel. Okay, so uh, programmatic statements are just statements that sort of set up the agenda. Key passages, we always do that when we introduce a book. A book. I give you, uh, here are a couple key passages from this book that we need to keep in mind as we look at the book. Like Matthew 1, 21 through 23. What's interesting about that, and obviously I'm not going to get through all these now, right? Obviously we're going to have to finish these next time. <laughs> but... Um, in that opening statement where Jesus says he's come to save his people, let me just finish this, from their sins. Okay, the angel announces that. And that um, he'll be born of a virgin and he'll be Emmanuel, which is God with us. But see, then at the end of Matthew's gospel, what does Jesus say? Make disciples of all the nations. And lo, and behold, I'm with you always even till the end of the age so matthew's telling us how in christ god has come to be present with us and that he continues to be present with us through christ in the body of christ as we do the work of christ see that that's sort of like a programmatic statement that sets up the gospel and can be very helpful then in, in the way that you that you look at the rest of the gospel all right well, let me do this before we go let me just show you what they are so examine repeated themes, phrases, and theological emphases. Examine editorial comments that interpret the significance of the event. At least we can get them on the video. Note the responses of original witnesses to an event. That can be a clue to interpreting the gospel accounts. Look for possible connections between the narrative discourse material and the immediate context. Carefully examine all the Old Testament quotations and allusions. And then finally, consider the significance of the events against the, the background of Old Testament teaching and first century Jewish theology. We'll, we'll have to finish, we'll have to look at those next time before we begin our overview of Matthew. But, well, you knew I wouldn't get through them. You knew when I said I was going to try to get through all of them. You rolled your eyes and you just, you knew, you knew it, I couldn't do it. Thank you for your good attention today.